Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're looking into something pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. A claim that uh, these ancient religious texts, their eternal truths, are actually being validated, fundamentally so, by cutting-edge modern science. Right, specifically quantum physics. It's a bold connection. It really is. And the sources we're diving into, they're articles by Rabbi Shlomo Izagwi focusing on, well, Torah wisdom and how it might connect to cosmology. Exactly. And, you know, this isn't an entirely new thought. The groundwork, the sort of core thesis, comes from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Okay. Back in 1972, he stated pretty clearly that nothing, absolutely nothing in existence, can endure without having its source in Torah. Wow. So our mission here is to figure out if this convergence is, you know, real. Is the Torah just moral guidance, or is it, like these sources suggest, the actual operating system? the blueprint for the universe itself. That's the question. We're trying to find that underlying logic, maybe hidden in texts that many people today might just dismiss as, I don't know, arbitrary rituals or old stories. Let's uh, let's unpack this. Okay. Well, this whole approach, it really reframes the idea of the Torah as a perfect, complete system. How so? There's a teaching in the Jerusalem Talmud. It interprets a specific verse. It is not an empty thing for you. Right. And the interpretation is basically, if you look at the Torah or some part of life and you don't see the relevance, the emptiness isn't in the Torah. Uh -huh. The deficiency, the lack, is in you, the observer, in your understanding. Okay, that immediately changes the perspective, doesn't it? Completely. It suggests that if a commandment seems illogical to us or just impractical, yeah. the problem isn't the ancient law itself. It might just be the limits of our current knowledge. Precisely. And that's why this potential convergence with science is seen as so powerful by the sources. It acts as a kind of validation. Right, like proof of concept almost. Kind of, yeah. If you see that certain ancient laws seem to echo the precision we're finding in, say, quantum physics, mm -hmm. it really strengthens your respect for the whole system, even the parts we don't understand yet scientifically. It's like trusting a doctor, right? Mm. If their past diagnoses were spot on, you trust their judgment now, even if the current situation is complex. Exactly that analogy. You trust the source because its track record where verifiable holds up. I get that. So if these connections are real, it shifts the commandments from just being rules to something more like fundamental laws of nature. That's the implication. Okay, let's move from the general idea of the philosophy and get into the really surprising specifics. Yeah. Our sources point to two amazing parallels from Maimonides' legal writings. Right. And maybe we should just quickly say who Maimonides was for anyone listening. Good point. We're talking about Rabbi Moses ben Maimon, lived in the 12th century, a towering figure, philosopher, physician, and his legal code, the Mishnah Torah, is just foundational for Jewish law. So we're talking about a definitive source of classical wisdom here. Absolutely. The ultimate synthesis. Got it. Okay. So the first parallel. Maimonides talks about a sin offering. An animal designated for sacrifice, which gives it this spiritual sanctity. Right. A specific status. But say this animal gets lost. The owner has to replace it to fulfill the obligation. Mm -hmm. Later on, though, the original animal is found. Now, its status is complicated, right? It yeah. still has sanctity, but it's not needed for the offering anymore. Exactly. And Maimonides rules on what happens to this first animal. It has to be left to die naturally. Okay. It can't be used for the sacrifice because the replacement took its place. Its status fundamentally changed, but how it changes, that's the astonishing part. The trigger for the change. Yes. The status shifts the instant the animal is legally considered found. And the definition of found is, this is the bit that jumps out. This is the kicker. Maimonides rules very explicitly that if even one single person anywhere on earth, anywhere, anywhere, becomes aware that the original lost animal is still alive, its legal and spiritual status instantly changes from lost to found. Wow. He even notes this was a very specific teaching passed down from Moses. One person's consciousness, their awareness, transforms the reality of that animal no matter the distance. That is uncanny. <laughs> okay, before we make the direct quantum link, can you give us like the 30 second version of the quantum idea of this mirrors wave function collapse? Sure. So uh, quantum mechanics 101, basically, a tiny particle like an electron, before you measure it, it doesn't have a fixed position or state. Right. It exists in what's called superposition. It's potentially in many states or places at once. 
Think of a spinning coin being both heads and tails simultaneously. Yeah. The moment you observe it or measure it, that cloud of possibilities, the wave function, collapses. It snaps into one single definite reality, heads or tails. So drawing the parallel, mm -hmm. the lost animal is kind of in superposition. It's both sacred and lost and recovered and alive. Sort of, yes, in terms of its legal and spiritual status. Until the awareness of just one person anywhere collapses its status into the single reality of found. That's the connection the forces make, this instantaneous effect of awareness, of consciousness, defining reality, both physical and spiritual, seems embedded right into this ancient law. The observer isn't passive. Not at all. The act of knowing, of being aware, is presented as an active force in shaping reality, and crucially, it acts independent of physical distance. That's really compelling. But playing devil's advocate for a second, mm -hmm. isn't this maybe reading a bit too much into it? Is it a metaphor or is there any suggestion Maimonides understood this non-local effect literally? Are we just mapping modern physics onto an old law? That's the critical question, absolutely. Huh. And Maimonides wasn't doing physics experiments, obviously. He was working from received tradition, spiritual insight. Right. But the argument from the sources hinges on the sheer specificity, that detail even a single person anywhere in the world. Yeah, that's hard to ignore. If it were just about practicalities, like the owner finding it, Distance wouldn't matter in that universal sense. Only the owner's knowledge would be key. But the law insists on this potentially remote, single point of awareness triggering the change. That suggests, they argue, an understanding of non-local reality that science only caught up with centuries later. Okay, that specificity does make it harder to dismiss as pure coincidence. It's very pointed. It is. Let's look at the second parallel then. This one involves relationship and distance. It comes yeah. from Leviticus chapter 22, verse 28. Yeah, yes. The rule against slaughtering an ox or a sheep and its offspring on the very same day. Right. A law that clearly speaks to the sanctity of that parent-child bond, even in animals. Hmm. But the crucial detail Maimonides highlights, again, is how far this applies. The prohibition holds true even if the parent and the offspring are separated by, quote, great distances. Miles apart. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And furthermore, even if they're owned by two completely different people. Wow, okay. So physical separation, check. Hmm. Different ownership, check. Neither breaks the connection. Exactly. The underlying relationship, that spiritual or familial link, transcends location and legal ownership. It's the dominant factor. And the quantum connection here is... Instantaneous. It mirrors quantum entanglement. Spooky action at a distance. And that's the one Einstein famously called it. You have two particles, say photons, created together. They become linked, entangled, they share a destiny. Right. If you measure a property of one particle, say its spin, you instantly know the spin of the other one. Instantly, no matter if it's across the lab bench or across the universe. There's no signal traveling between them. No known signal, not in the classical sense. It's faster than light. Their fates are intertwined regardless of separation. So the Torah law reflects this. The parent-offspring bond is like an entangled state unaffected by distance or ownership changes. That's the parallel being drawn. Both systems, ancient law and modern physics, seem to reveal that fundamental connections and the influence of awareness operate outside our normal constraints of space and time. Okay, so we've got two pretty compelling examples here. Observer effect in the lost animal case, non-local connection or entanglement in the parent-offspring law. Mm -hmm. If we step back and look at the bigger picture these sources are painting, what does it mean? Well, it's just the Torah isn't just a historical document or even just a moral guide. Sure. It's positioned as the eternal blueprint for creation itself, the underlying code. The commandments aren't just arbitrary rules from a specific culture. They're expressions of how the universe actually is structured. That's the idea, the deepest, most fundamental structure. Which then reframes the whole idea of living according to these principles. Absolutely. It suggests that choosing to live by Torah isn't just an act of faith in the conventional sense. It's more like aligning yourself with reality. Aligning yourself with the fundamental laws of existence. Being in harmony with the cosmos's actual architecture, which science is perhaps only now starting to rediscover or map out in its own language. You're sort of ahead of the curve in a way. That's a powerful thought. And this concept that the spiritual knowledge is the source and the physical world is the expression. And there's a great story that illustrates this. It involves Rabbi Shalom Bershnerson, known as the Rashab. Okay, let's hear it. This sounds like it connects the dots. Right. So the story goes, the Rashab was about to wash his hands before a meal. 
standard ritual. Mm -hmm. And his younger brother bursts in all excited. He just heard about a new discovery by some French doctors. A medical discovery. Yes. Apparently, these doctors had identified a specific previously unnoticed vein at the back of the head. Okay. And what was special about this vein? Well, the doctors claimed it was directly linked to cognitive function. They'd found that when a person leans forward, blood flow increases in a way that helps concentration, focus. But when the person leans back, the blood flow shifts slightly, aiding memory and recall. They thought this was groundbreaking anatomical insight. And the Rashab's reaction? He just listened. He listened carefully, yes. Yeah. Didn't say much immediately. Then, after the meal, he went to his study and came back with a book. An old book. Written by? Written by the Midler Rebbe, who was the second Shabbat Rebbe. Lived about a century before these French doctors made their discovery. A hundred years earlier. Yeah. And the Rashab opens this old text. And there it is. No way. Clear as day. A description of the exact same vein at the back of the head explaining its precise function leaning forward helps concentration. Leaning back aids memory. Almost word for word what the French doctors had just announced. So this physiological detail, this medical fact, was already documented in a spiritual text a century earlier. Exactly. Known through spiritual understanding long before it was discovered through physical examination or experimentation. That's incredible. Did someone ask how the Midler Rebbe knew? Was he a doctor? Someone did ask that, naturally. And the Rashab explained the core principle we've been discussing. He said, essentially, that everything physical in this world has its origin, its root, in the higher spiritual realms. The blueprint idea again. Precisely. So you have two ways to discover something. You can perceive the spiritual root above, and from that, understand its physical expression below. Right. Or you can start below, discover the physical phenomenon through observation or experiment, and then maybe recognize its spiritual root above. The Mittler Rebbe saw the blueprint first. The doctors found the physical manifestation later. Wow. Okay. That anecdote really brings it all together. It provides a kind of framework for understanding these parallels we've discussed. It does. So let's try to synthesize this deep dive. We started with this uh, pretty bold claim. Ancient laws, like about lost animals or not slaughtering parent and child on the same day, somehow mirror advanced quantum physics concepts. Right. The observer effect and non-local connection or entanglement. And we found that the sources argue forcefully that, yes, these ancient texts and modern physics seem to share fundamental ideas, consciousness shaping reality, and deep connections transcending space and time. Ideas science is still grappling with, really. Absolutely. The most basic laws of how reality functions might just be woven right into this ancient wisdom. Which naturally leads to a big question for you, the listener. Mm -hmm. If these texts, often seen as just history or theology, seem to contain insights into physics that we only confirmed in the last hundred years, well, what does that imply? Where else should we be looking for truth? Exactly. Does it change where we look for ultimate truth? What other discoveries might be waiting in sources we've maybe overlooked or haven't understood properly yet? It definitely challenges a simple separation between, say, faith and science or ancient wisdom and modern knowledge. It suggests a deeper integration might be possible or even necessary. Okay. And a final thought for people to maybe mull over. Well, think about that second law, the parent and offspring. If that bond, that connection, is presented as so fundamental that it ignores vast distances, even legal separation, like different ownership, right. what might that suggest about the true nature of our relationships? Human connections, family bonds. That they're not just physical or social. Perhaps. Maybe that entanglement, that non-physical connection between people we care about is far more real, more profound, and maybe more enduring than our everyday experience usually lets us believe. Something to think about. 